Hi, my name is Stephen Wicks. I'm the host of Why We Teach Moments with Think Circa. Joining us today is Sean Walton, an educator, an experienced educator who wants to share with us her journey in education. And we also want to know, why does she teach? So tell us a little bit, Ms. Walton, how are you doing today, first of all? I'm doing great. It's a nice sunny day outside. Awesome, awesome. Uh, well, let's go ahead and just tell us a little bit about yourself and your journey as an educator. All right, well, um, my journey as an educator started fairly late in life. Well, I guess middle-aged, really. Um, I, li I grew up in the Austin area and um, my degree was in journalism and I bounced around doing different types of jobs. I began as a broadcaster, broadcast news. I worked as also um, a special events coordinator. So I did fundraising and things like that for a local nonprofit. Um, then I also worked as a technical writer. So I used my skills as a journalist doing different things in technical writing. Wound up working for a computer company and I did business, I was a business analyst as well as a resource and project manager in the software engineering department. And I was able to use a lot of my soft skills, you know, writing, management, communication, all that kind of stuff. And I learned um, project management and uh, working with, well, I've always worked with schedules, but I mean, specifically deadlines and all these multiple milestones and all that kind of thing. Well, I ended up having two children. And when my son was going into the sixth grade and my daughter was going into the second grade, we decided at that point we were living in Georgetown, Texas, and it was just getting big. And we wanted our children to grow up in a small school, a small area. So we bought purchased land about an hour and a half east of Austin. And <clears throat> we live in a very rural community. We own 54 acres of land. And um, the school that I teach at is the school that my kids went to through the eighth grade. It's a it's Gauze ISD and it's a pre-K through eighth grade school. We don't have a high school, so our kids have to go to schools within the area. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're very small. Uh, I did not when we moved here, my plan was to just be a stay at home mom, but I'd been working forever and that just <laughs> didn't work out. So I began substitute teaching at Gauze and I realized I, I enjoyed it. So when I was probably 44 or 45, I ended up getting my teaching certificate and I taught fourth and fifth grade math for a year, fourth and fifth grade English for a year. And now I'm teaching for the last eight or nine years, I've been teaching sixth, seventh and eighth grade English and uh, sixth grade computer. And I have a team of teachers that work with me. I've got a science teacher, a math teacher, and a social studies teacher. And we all teach the junior high. And I, I enjoy that because we get the kids. It's sort of almost like a private school experience because we get the kids in the sixth grade and we have them all the way through the eighth grade. So I can really, we really can work with them and we can see how they grow. And it's just so amazing to see these kids coming in not you know they don't know anything in the sixth grade and there's just still so much like little babies and then by the time they're in the eighth grade the difference is amazing and i i love it i really do wow that's amazing so you came to this is the second career then pretty <laughs> much it's a second career yes right wow awesome that's very inspirational for a lot of people i know a lot of people today you know they they're 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 not just doing one thing in life. They're really, you know, they have these periods of life where they're doing different things. And, and, and I think that's that's really uh, important to have that spirit because, you know, it's, I think the, the days of, of having one job and, and retiring from that job and getting the, you know, the, the watch or the, right. <laughs> you know, the retirement, uh, it's just a little different these days. So that is, that is uh, inspirational. Um, and such a noble thing to get into for your second career. So thank you for that. Um, so let me ask you, why is literacy instruction so important to you as a teacher? Well, I think it's because if, if you're not quote unquote literate, there's not, you're not very valuable. First off, you're not very valuable to an organization when you, when you graduate high school. 
Um, secondly, it's important because just the, the texts and all the information you use to teach those skills, you know, it, it's enriching, right? So you're, you're not only teaching kids how to read and how to write and, and all that kind of stuff, but you're expanding their world. Um, you, you know, when you're reading, because I, I do a lot of poetry that's always mixed in with everything I do. And, you know, just knowing who those people are and, and it, it just enriches their worldview. And uh, I like to point out to them that, you know, why am I reading this? You know, I don't care about this person or whatever, whatever. But then all of a sudden you're watching some Disney cartoon and they're referencing something out, you know, something from the past that was that was in a book or a poem that they had just read about. So it's it, it's understanding the culture from of where we're coming from. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I like to do all kinds of different you know, show them all kinds of different types of writers and types of authors. Uh, but coming from the world that I was in and then listening to my husband, who is currently in that world, you know, they've got kids coming out of there that 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 can't read, they can't write. And, they, and then on top of that, they don't have the critical thinking skills. And with a lot of the, the things that you can do in, with English instruction, you can teach them those critical thinking skills. You can teach them to be responsible for for their learning, or at least the way that I have my class structured. So I think the other thing that I really feel is important is teaching them those soft skills, how to communicate, how to organize your time, how to plan for your time, how to take responsibility for your work and ask for help and come up to the teacher and say, look, th this is what's going on. Or if you're running late or if you're having trouble finishing something, let me know, you know. So it's it's all those things of the underneath part that makes you an employee that somebody wants to have. Because being able to take the initiative, that's, that's what they're looking for. And they're looking for people who are creative and can think outside the box and all those things. And I, I take that and I try to prepare them. For, with those skills because those are skills that are hard to learn and, and if and if they start at a young age and they know that it's important um, then they can move on and then as far as it's just the joy of reading for me too and um, they always have books we always read they they pick their own book all the time and we always have time to read and we build our own vocabulary lists and so the list of vocabulary that they learn is a one that the class built themselves and it's funny because they'll grab a word if they hear it and say, that's my word. And then they'll be reading or listening or hearing something and say, we have that word on our vocabulary list. And and so it's, it's just, you know, kind of creating a community around the literacy to make it fun for them to develop those skills and they don't really know they're developing them. Yes. Wow, sounds so rewarding. Uh, which is goes into our next question. Um, they want to know, what is your advice to other teachers regarding the awesomeness of the teaching profession? I think you touched a little bit of, of that in your previous answer, but what else would you have to say about how awesome it is to be a teacher? I, I think the biggest thing about that I found being a teacher, and again, my only experience is limited. It's to this small school, so I, I can't speak to larger school districts. Mm -hmm. But it's just um, the relationships that you get with these students because they, you know, regardless of whether, oh, I hate that teacher, I hate Miss So-and-so or whatever, but at the same time, they, they, they expect to have you in their life. And you are in some ways making an impact on those kids. And then when they come and they ask you for advice or when you're, you know, at their high school graduation, or you happen to see them out somewhere and they run up to you and they're like, Miss Walton, and they're excited to see you. It's very gratifying to know that, oh, maybe I did make a make a difference in, in their lives. Or they'll come back and they'll tell me or tell my all of our all of us that man, what y'all told us was so true and and it, it's I'm so glad I went I had you as a teacher because now English is easy in high school or what whatever. So it's rewarding and then it's also rewarding to see what they do 
because being again in a small community, you can kind of keep up with where they go, right? So a lot yes. of times they'll come back and, and to to see what they end up doing outside out out of school. And it I, I it makes me feel it makes me feel really good to feel like I'm having some kind of an impact on these children. Absolutely, yeah. As a teacher, your reach is 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 far and extensive. <laughs> I tell you. Um, Thank you for sharing that. Um, do you have a, as you, you know, teach ELA, is there any particular lesson that has resonated with you and your students recently? Like well, I have a couple, um, I have a couple, especially there's a couple with the eighth grade that I really like. Okay. Um, one of them I do when we come back from Christmas, it, <coughs> excuse me, and it's teaching them about dystopias dystopian worlds and so we learn about what a dystopia is what a utopia is where did the word come from we look at you know they do their own you know so a lot of it is working together to do your own research and coming up with their own definition of what a dystopia is and then looking at real life examples of dystopias um and then looking at how that is shown in fiction because you know you have the hunger games and things like that right walking dead you know different ones that they can relate to and it all culminates in they break up into groups and they create their own dystopian world and where they uh you know have to create the the constitution and the bill of rights they have a backstory on how did this even become a dystopia um is it is it a anarchy or is it totalitarianism or whatever? What kind of government is it? How are the people treated? You know, all these different things about the world and they create their flag and they create their map. And so they build a world, their own world around this idea of a dystopia and they really get into it. They, re they, they really like that. And I, hopefully they come out with something, but leading up to that there's you know there's an essay involved and in, in, you know your basic english things but they're also working towards that end goal of creating that dystopian world mm -hmm. yes that's a very interesting uh lesson especially in these days and times it's <laughs> important for young people to be thinking about these things um can you share a time that you tried a new strategy with their with your students um, well, several, there have been several new strategies that I've tried, um, a while back and I've been doing it for a while. I've, you know, you peruse the internets and I've come up with, because they all read their own books. And so there's gotta be a way to say, you know, are they like learning or actually reading these books, you know, besides asking them what page are you on? and you know, all the basic questions. And so they do, a, I have a list and I've created, I've got a website for them to go to where they can choose a project that can show how, you know, what, tell us about their book. So it, it's, it's almost like a persuasive project in a way. And so there's different things that they can do. They can create a pamphlet, they can create a game. Um, what else can they, they can create a sculpture. They can just different ways of showing parts of that book. And then I have criteria that they have to tell you what the plot is and all that kind of stuff. But it's, it, it allows them to choose their own creative way of showing of showing that they've read that book. So that's one, one thing that I've done. The other thing is um, with the vocabulary where they, they build their own list. So at the beginning of the year, I tell them, you know, we're gonna build our own list and here's the ways that you can get your vocabulary words. You can get it through your own choice book through a text that we read, um, through a text that you might read somewhere else. If you see it on the, hear it on the TV, if you hear it, you're standing in a grocery line and you hear people talking and there's a word or you're talking to your parents and you come up with a word and we define the difference between a tier one, a tier two and a tier three word. Tier two are the, the words that we look for. Um, anyway, so the type of words that we're looking for. And then we build we build that each week they have a word, they put it on a padlet and then they vote on the top three words and the words with the top most votes, the top three will be added to their list. And then from there, 
every time I do something, I'm making them use those words. So I'll tell them, you know, we'll have a, I've got another vocabulary projects where they choose what they want to do. And um, they have to use their words in that, or I'll tell them you need to write a five stanza poem. And in each stanza, you've got to have a vocabulary word or whatever. So they're always working with the words that way. And those were, and I was just flying by the seat of my pants when I first started doing it. And now I've got it more tailored and, you know, I've got a little website for them to go to and they can pick, choose what they want and things like that. So this, and then one more, one last, <laughs> this year, I, uh, what I, what I did with the eighth grade, we do Edgar Allan Poe and we, I started off with Gothic, what is Gothic literature? And then, and I had them work as a group to make that definition of what is Gothic literature. So we had a document that they put in and they had all the things that descriptions of what Gothic literature is. And so we talked about that and ideas of what Gothic literature is. And I thought that was, and I use that again with the dystopian world, like I talked about earlier. And I think that's a really good way for them, instead of me telling them, here's the definition of Gothic literature, they're all going independently and looking at it. And then they're putting it together in a doc that we can all look at together as a group and um, say, yeah, that's what we think. And so they were able to use that document all the way through. If they were writing an essay or if we were reading a Poe story or some Gothic poems or whatever, they had that that I could reference back to. And it was a document that they had built and it really helped. And then in the end, I had them build they each in the groups, they built a Jeopardy game and they were able to use that document. And of course, some of the other things that we talked about. And and that was new for me. I, I'd never done that before. And it, I think it really worked. Wow. Yeah, that sounds that sounds very, very engaging. <laughs> you know, it's, we, we, we want these types of teachers in our classrooms because this is really what what we need in terms of getting our kids excited about school excited about being there with their peers and, and go, tackling all of these different topics and, and issues. I, I really love to see that. Um, next question for you. Have you ever had to use a brand new, brand spanking new curriculum? And Every single like? year. Every single Yeah, I'm not. So, <laughs> so the luxury of okay. being in a small school yes. is that I am the only English teacher for the sixth, okay. seventh and eighth grade. I am the curriculum director for the sixth, seventh and eighth grade. So I get to decide as long as my kids are passing the star test and learning what they need to learn, um, what curriculum I want to use. So I use a smorgasbord of curriculum. Uh, my go-tos, I, 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 I really like Think Circa and I'm looking forward to the AI part of that where it's really helping them you know, the AI is going to help them revise and edit. I think that's going to be a game changer. Uh, I, I combine that with several other ones. Um, I use Common Lit. I use Newzella. I'll use Readworks. Sometimes I use Actively Learn. So I use all, I pull from different sources when I'm trying, because each place has its specialty. And a lot of times I can go from one to the other and then I combine it into something. And, and so that allows me a little bit of leeway. So if I want to change it up the next year, I can go back and look and say, OK, well, I kind of liked using this one better. It made better sense. Mm -hmm. um, and then at the same time, I use uh, Padlet and, and some other things where they can express their self, themselves through, you know, creating something. But. I wouldn't say that I stick with just one curriculum and uh, honestly, I, I don't I don't know how well I would do in a school where you have multiple seventh or eighth grade teachers and y'all all got to be on the same page because, you know, you got eight seventh grade classes in, in one school and they all got to be taught the same thing. So I don't I don't know how well I would do with that. Honestly. Mm. That is a that's a whole thing. That's the yeah, thing. It, it, it's a totally different environment. So yes. I. I, I, I can't really relate to that, and but uh, for me, I, I just, I, ca I cannot stick with just one. And I've tried some of the bigger ones and I, I just, I like doing this better. I, li I like being able to do this better. All right. Um, has anything recently affirmed your beliefs in teaching and learning? Um, 
Well, I don't know if I've really ever needed affirmation that it was important because I've always felt like it was important. I think mm -hmm. what has happened is a lot of people out there go on and on about how unimportant it is or about how broken the system is. I think if you look at teachers themselves, the only reason we're here, well, I mean, there's a bunch of reasons, I guess, but you know, when it comes down to it, you become, you become a teacher to help kids and to, and to teach kids. And I still feel like that's the, the core of that. And, you know, the, where I get affirmation is when I have kids that are excited to be in my class and the, you know, they'll come in that they'll say they're glad to be here. Uh, you know, then you have the ones that don't want to do anything because there's always those, but then being able to work with them and, and, you know, if you do the different modes of how they can learn, you pull something out of them and, and they surprise you, that, that is really where you feel like, okay, this kid has potential and he just showed me what his potential is. Mm -hmm. Yes, that is good. I love that answer. Um, now let's let's move to the thing that a lot of people love data uh <laughs> do you feel that using data is critical to the success of targeted intervention planning i think to a point it is um you know I'll, like i've said before, several times already being in a the school that i'm in i know i know these kids so data is important to me but i can already i for me i i can already see where their weaknesses are and so it, it it's not as important to me as it might be if i was teaching multiple classes of the same you know if i had 30 kids and six classes or whatever every day the data may be more because i've got so many more kids that i've got to deal with right but uh I, and i still look at data now um, but the way, personally speaking, the way that the Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills, the way that it's organized, I'm almost hitting all of those teaks, that's what we call them, all of those teaks almost every single day or every single week. And when it comes down to it, the main ones that, I, that usually needs intervention is the critical thinking part, um, you know, comprehension, synthesis, inference, you know, con using context to figure out the meaning of a word. You know, it's it's all, it, it's over and over and over. It's kind of these same sorts of things. And so I try to target what I do to those areas. And so that way I'm hitting them all the time. Yes, good, good. It, it, it informs the instruction. Very yes. Good. Um, and couple more questions. We're almost done. Is there a time that you championed an initiative at your school? Yes. Um, I've been using Google Classroom since I started teaching, basically. So for about, a, you know, what, 10 years, 11 years, something like that. Mm -hmm. And I still use it. Um, when COVID hit and we went, you know, yeah, everybody had to go home. Well, in Texas, they all came back in the fall or most of them, not all of them. But I uh, brought that up and I was like, this is what we need to use, especially at the junior high level, um, to push that out, that push our um, lessons out. Because these kids need to learn. And, and granted, I still do some written, you know, obviously written stuff, but it's really important that they learn how to use online tools like that. Because when they grow up, if they go into a, a white collar type profession, most of their work's going to be on the computer. And then if they go to college, it's all going to be on Blackboard or something like that. So they'll be using online tools, you know, from now on. And so I, I did a, a big training on how to do that. And a lot, and a lot of people adopted it. I, I think the, uh, I, the biggest issue is, especially for some of the math teachers and the, the teachers in the younger grades, they it's it's a it's a it's a change in the way that you think when you're doing those lessons it, and it's not 
you don't want to try to do a traditional way. Of, I don't do a traditional way of teaching when you do those lessons. And so it's some of the teachers dropped out of it. Some of the teachers still use it. So um, I did not remain the champion of that. You know, I was like, you, you be you and you can use it. But for the time that we were using it across the board, it was successful. Mm -hmm. um, and then the ones that wanted to keep using it still used it. And, and I still use it today. Yeah. So speaking of that, so being putting yourself out there and being the champion of something that's that's different, that's new, uh, how was it leading the charge? Uh, do you feel like it was worth it in terms of the betterment of your students? So what are your thoughts with um, I think it, I think it was to the betterment of the students. Uh, I the fourth and fifth grade are now starting to use it more. Uh, you know, so by the, because when they come from the fifth grade into the sixth grade, it's a huge jump. And, you know, the way that, that I teach, they, you know, it, it's personal responsibility. And, you know, I push out the lessons and I'm like, this is, these are the assignments we're going to do this week. They're all up there. We're going to do this. And, you know, all the, there's all these different things. So I'm trying to, it's almost a project management style of pushing out and having them work with these due dates and all these different things. And so there's a lot more thrown onto them when they come into junior high because they've got, you know, different classrooms that they're moving to. Whereas in fourth and fifth, they've just been in one classroom. Mm -hmm. um, and so to on top of that, to have to learn how to use Google Classroom, it, it's just an added pressure. And so I, I've seen the benefit of this as I, you know, I talk to the fourth and fifth grade, especially trying to, you know, making sure that th th this is something that that will benefit you also. Here's some things that you can do. And they're starting to do more on there. When the kids come here, they're easy, more easily able to move into it and, and to move into the, the higher expectations that we have in the junior high. Mm -hmm. So it, it has worked at that. The, the lower levels, third grade down, that's a little bit different. They do things a little bit different, but fourth and fifth, that's where I'm really trying to push, you know, get them in the, get them in the classroom, at least for some of your activities and, and all that. And those teachers are, are doing that. Got it. Well, I think that's it. I think we're at the end of our interview. Thank you so much for Ms. Walton for sharing your insights with us. And again, everyone, thank you for watching Why We Teach Moments with Think Circa. Ms. Walton, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.